particular passage of scripture as we call it the flight out of out of Egypt but by your heads real quick God of heaven thank you for your goodness your mercy your kindness God we thank you oh God for your word that brings us life this morning I pray, O oh God, that as we embark, O oh God, to hear what you have to say to us, I pray that you will bless us in very special and definite ways. God, bless us to hear and to receive the word of the Lord this morning. Some of us need to be comforted. Some of us need to be encouraged. Some of us need to hear a word from you, O oh God. And I pray in Jesus' name that we lean and trust on your word this morning, that you're able to do exceeding and abundantly yes. above all we could ever ask or think. Yes. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated in God's presence. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> don't, don't get nervous. <laughs> it, it's fine. Uh, the word of the Lord is, 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 is a strong tower where the righteous can run in and they are safe. Uh, I asked Malcolm to come help me out a little uh, this morning, uh, particularly because all of us have uh, been watching the news and all of us have been listening to the radio um, and we are mourning with the world. Of a great leader, a great yes, man, yes. Uh, Nelson Mandela, yes. uh, who was, amen, yes. put your hands together, God bless him. God, God bless him, and uh, I, I think that some of what God has been speaking in my heart, and as I looked in scripture, kind of speaks to the day and to us, and I asked Malcolm to come and just give some reflection on the life of, uh, and the struggles of Nelson Mandela on the continent uh, of Africa, and uh, he's going to come share with us, and then I'll push over, and I'll do my part, you do your Amen. part, then I'll do my part, All then we'll right. work it out that way. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a privilege for me to speak a few words about Nelson Mandela. And I particularly feel privileged that I am living in what I would call Mandela's time. It's one thing to read about Malcolm X and to read about Martin Luther King. It's one thing to read about Frederick Douglass and yeah. Abraham Lincoln, uh -huh. but to have lived at the same time, yeah. Yeah. to have walked the same earth, to have breathed the same air yeah. that a man like Mandela yeah. breathed, yeah. Uh, just makes me know that greatness is possible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was 14 years old when I participated in my first free Nelson Mandela rally. Right. This was 1987. And I remember at the time thinking to myself that the man for whom I was rallying had actually been in jail for 24 years. Wow. 24, he'd been in jail for 24 years yeah. in 1987. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't steal anything. Yeah. The yeah. only reason why Mandela was in jail was because he believed that there had to be and there was an equality of all races. Yes. He believed that God created all of us to be equal. Yes. That was the only reason why Mandela was imprisoned. And I've had the privilege of, of living in South Africa for two years. And I, I tell people, I told South Africans when I lived there, I still tell people today that South Africa is probably the single most beautiful country I've ever seen. And it's easy to understand why the Dutch, the Portuguese, and the English went there okay. and decided they were never going back. <laughs> and decided that instead of sharing the place, they wanted to take it over. Take it over. Um, there are two lessons that I would like to share with you today about Mandela's life. I mean, there are many things people would share about Mandela's life. His dedication to the struggle, a lot of those things are political. But there are, I think, two lessons that are pertinent to Christian faith that I think Mandela's life uh, definitely teaches me and I'm hoping uh, you know once I'm done sharing this that you would also see how uh, it might also be something that might might teach us as well so the first lesson that I have learned from Mandela's life is that love trumps all you know when the Pharisees asked Jesus uh, they were trying to set him up but the question they asked him was, what was the most important commandment? And what Jesus said was simple. He said, love God with all your heart and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's easy to love your neighbor if your neighbor is just the person living across the door from you. 
it's easy to love your neighbor if you're sometimes it's difficult to love your neighbor if your neighbor is a trifling brother a trifling uh -huh. sister uh, <laughs> a nagging you know, right. mother in law right. like but what if your neighbor what if that neighbor that you're supposed to love is somebody that believes you are not human what if that neighbor is someone that believes that you and your kind should not walk the same earth that they do, should not go to the same schools that they go to, should not buy from the same stores that they buy from? What if your neighbor denies you your humanity? What if your neighbor imprisons you for 27 years for doing absolutely nothing? What if your neighbor shoots your children? Wow. Because they dared to say right. they wanted change. Yeah. What if your neighbor rapes your wives, your daughters? Yeah. Your, what if your neighbor kills your sons? Uh. Can you love that neighbor? Mm. I think Mandela's life teaches us that it is possible yeah. to love such a neighbor. Yeah. This man was in jail for 27 years. And what I find fascinating about his life was that there were periods within those 27 years when he was offered freedom. Yes. And all they wanted from him was just renounce the struggle. Right. Tell your people you would never fight again. Okay. We will release you. You will never speak another word. And you will live out your life in solitude and quietness. And every single time that Mandela was made that offer, <laughs> simple thing he said was there is no way I will be free when the rest of my people are not free. 27 years. And one of the things that Mandela's life also teaches is, um, and for those who have read his book, he says this in his book, that sometimes what motivates people who oppress is actually not power, it is fear. So one of the reasons why apartheid, and let me just describe what apartheid was. Right. You know, I, it's preaching to the choir, but apartheid, everybody here is African American. So the history of slavery and the history of segregation is not new to anyone. But take that and add these additional elements. In the US, if you had a drop of black, you were black. In South Africa, if you had a drop of anything apart from black, you were not black. So let me explain what I mean. You had blacks, but then you had another class in South Africa called colors. Uh -huh. Many of you in this room would not have been called black in South Africa. You are too fair to be black. You'd have been called colored. Uh -huh. And beyond colored, there was another class of, so Indians, Chinese, so it was uh -huh. black. And then if you had any drop of anything that wasn't black, you were another class. Uh -huh. And if you had any drop of anything else that was above that, you were in a completely different class. And the reason was simple. Today, in South Africa, the population is about 50 million. Only about 5 million of those are whites. So how do you subjugate a majority unless you find ways to divide them? And that was exactly what was done in South Africa every means possible to divide. In the same family, there was a law that they, had, they called it a comb test. So to decide whether you were black or colored, they would take a comb and pass it through your hair. If the comb got entangled in your hair, wow. you were black. black. And this was a law. This was the type of country that Mandela lived in. And for such a man who went through this, to come out of jail after 27 years, I mean, the first people who broke down crying when Mandela died were the jailers who were responsible for wow. him at Robben Island. Wow. It was his jailers. They were the first people to speak about wow. the humanity of Mandela. So love truly trumps all. It is possible to love even your enemies. Yeah. And I think Mandela's life just completely yeah. completely in all of its ramifications demonstrates that 
He lost his mother when he was in jail. He lost his first son when he was in jail. His marriage broke down when he was in jail. Everything about him just completely broke down. But when he emerged from prison, the biggest fear that the white minority government had was that now that blacks were in power, they were all going to go to jail, they were all going to be hounded for the crimes they committed. What Mandela did was different. Mandela understood that, look, if people, and this is the simple thing that he did, he set up something called the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And what he said was, anybody who is ready to come out and confess their sins, so they weren't going to forget that you killed people. They were not going to forget that you raped people. They were not going to forget that you tortured black people. But if you could come out, stand in front of the people that you did those things to, and confess that you did them, and document that you did them, and at the end of it ask for forgiveness, then you would be forgiven. And when Mandela said this, people were wondering, you know, is this man, is this man for real? But guess what? It worked. It worked. Yes. South Africa has been without apartheid for, since 1994. Wow. It's a thriving country. You will find people who tortured and those who tortured them side by side. You will find the white minority and the black majority that they oppressed 20 years ago side by side. You will watch them playing rugby or soccer or football and you will find those who were the former oppressors and those that were oppressed side by side. So love truly can conquer all. Yeah. Yeah. The second lesson that Mandela's life teaches uh, me is, is the fact that what is to come, and we say this a lot in church, that what's to come is truly greater than, than what's been. Yeah. Yeah. And his life also teaches that while things may not make any sense to us today, you know, one thing is clear. For those of us who are children of God and everybody here, every, all of us here are children of God, um, God's plan for us is always for good and not for evil. And I think as long as we believe that, when we look back over our lives, we will see that all of our paths are ordered everything that happens to us has a reason. When Mandela went to jail in 1964, he was the icon of black struggle. When he emerged from jail in 1990, he was the icon of global struggle. It didn't matter whether your struggle was about racial inequality or injustice. It didn't matter if your struggle was about economic inequality. By 1990, the Mandela of 1964 was just about the black struggle. The Mandela that came out in 1990 was about the global struggle against oppression. The Mandela that left office as president of South Africa in 1998 had actually become the father of the nation. Yeah. And for many people, you will hear him being referred to as Madiba. Yeah. Madiba simply means father. And the Mandela that died last week had become the moral conscience of the world. And it's for me, as a, as a black male, as a black person, I think it's to see every living president in the United States is traveling to South Africa next week wow. for Mandela's birthday. Yeah. There is no world leader that is not at the moment trying to make a beehive uh -huh. for South yeah. Africa. Uh, yeah. right. I don't know if in my time, there will be another person, black or white, whose death will have the type of impact yeah. that Mandela had. Yeah. But again, I am fortunate, I believe I'm fortunate, and all of us are fortunate, yeah. to live in a time where we can actually point to someone's life that was lived with integrity, that was lived with principles, Christian principles. I do not know Mr. Mandela's face. I know he's a Christian. I don't know if he was a practicing Christian. But I do know that everything he did, everything he believed in, the way he lived his life, the causes that he fought for, the philosophy by which he lived his life, the approach that he took to other people, his principles about life were principles that in my view just come straight out of the Bible. And um, my prayer is that now that he's gone, that we should, God would raise for us and for humanity another 
moral conscience that would be able to speak truth to power. And not only speak truth to power, but would have a life that backs up the moral integrity of their stands and that has a voice that was as loud as Mr. Mandela's voice that will continue to be uh, a beacon of light and hope for everybody around the world that is truly fighting oppression at whatever level and inequality at whatever levels that they have to deal with it. Thank you. To, to piggyback on, on all of, of what he said, yeah. what we find in scripture and what we find about ourselves and what we learn from the life of Nelson Mandela, what we learn from the life of Abraham and all of the other patriarchs of the faith is that there are particular people who are born in time, but born for a purpose. Yeah. That, that the time in which they, was born, they are born, they are married to a particular purpose that God has called them to. Uh -huh. In the same way, we can look at Abraham or you know, Isaac or Jacob and see the purposes of God. And we can look over our shoulders and see a Martin Luther King or a Rosa Parks or a Nelson Mandela. Is the same way we understand this Christ story. Yeah. That Jesus did not come randomly. That he, he did not come uh, just... Uh, to be uh, the person down the street but God had called him for such a time as this yeah. what we understand about apartheid and, and Malcolm so eloquently said it was that it was systemic it was it was systematic and let's let's put our uh, a note right here that uh, apartheid was started in 1948 by Dutch Christians all right. Five million who enslaved another 45 million and told them to do this in the name of Jesus. Wow. That if they were going to be uh, good slaves, they had to do it in Jesus' name. And mm -hmm. it was a systemic, uh, a, a governmental idea that the government was against two things. A person's being uh -huh. and against their well-being. That, that the apartheid murdered and killed innocent children and, 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 and raped women and all these different kind of things. And the one they left alive, like Mandela, they imprisoned or made their lives hard. Yes. And so we see in scriptures that when the Bible says in Exodus that when Egypt saw how strong the children of Israel were and how robust they were and how proficient they were in their workings and their doing, they say that we must enslave them lest they know how strong they are. And so there are things in history that ultimately repeat themselves over and over again. But thank God for the grace of Jesus Christ and the birth of Jesus Christ who makes us free from the law of sin and death. That, that when there were laws against us, when the devil had ruled, that he had legal access to our lives and he had legal course to reign and to wreak havoc and to bring darkness and for me to live in depression and oppression and all those different kind of things. Lo, Jesus came in the volume yeah. of the book to do the will of God. And so what I want us to understand about the power of the Christ child or the birth of Jesus Christ, that God was enacting his live own liberation. And for the Bible says that against every government that would oppress any people, he says that Jesus will come and the government would be upon his shoulders. Uh -huh. What does it mean that the government will be upon his shoulders? It means that the shoulders are the place where weight is given to the body. Uh -huh. That there is balance, that there is equity, that there is fairness, that there is justice. And so we know a symbol of justice is a counterbalance. Have you ever seen it in a court that there's a balance there? And what justice is supposed to do is that when there are inequities, the justice system is supposed to balance those yeah. things out. Yeah. And so when we were a slave to sin, when we were innocent, even before we had done anything, uh -huh. that, that when the enemy was against us, against our being and our well-being, Christ came and brought us equity. He brought us justice. He brought us liberty. And the Bible says that whom the Son sets free, free indeed. is free indeed. Yeah. We have been made free by the birth of Jesus Christ, yeah. even more so than the blood of Jesus All Christ. Right. 
But we understand in this Christ story why this particular story, this particular passage is, 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 is fascinating to me as I've reflected this year, this past week. And I want you to read uh, Luke's Gospel chapter 2. If you go up, the Bible says that when these magis or these wise men had came to Herod over when we see the Bible right now, we look in this patch of scripture, Jesus is about two years old. And the Bible says that when the, the wise men did not come back to Herod as they were supposed to, the Bible says that Herod got angry. Uh -huh. He got so angry that he gave a government order and said, I want all of the male children on two and under to be killed. Uh -huh. I, I mentioned this in, in Bible study on Wednesday. There's a, a fascinating book that I'm, I'm reading through called Killing Jesus. It's by Bill O'Reilly. I know, go figure. But he, he wrote this book and, and it is a historical account about the birth and the death of Jesus Christ and how he talks about how Herod, who was the Tetrarch, who was the governor of, of of, of Egypt at that time and the Bible says that, that Herod gave a decree and told the soldiers to go into all the villages go into all the hamlets wherever they, they are and search for all of the children male and they would go into the houses at night and it says that they would go in with a, a, a spear or they would go in with rocks and they would snatch children from their mother's arms and they would uh, as the, the, the mothers would try to hide the children they would find the children crying and when they heard the voice the Bible says that they, the, the, the book says that they would go in and search for the children and slay them by the sword. Some of them they threw off cliffs. They, they were heinous and, and cruel. And I want you to understand this was a time in which Jesus was born. Uh -huh. That he was born against a government and born into a time where the government was against his being and his well-being. He was born at risk. There was, uh, according to the scripture, he had no life expectancy to live past two. The age of two because there was a decree for, for the, the soldiers to go kill him. But I am so glad that God through his grace will speak to us. The Bible says that the angel came to, to Joseph in a dream and said, listen, the government yeah. may be against you, but God is for you. Yeah. And put a note right there, greater is he that is with us yeah. than he that is yeah. against us. And the Bible says there is a way out. Yeah. You have to know whatever your oppression is today that there is a way out. Yeah. What Mandela's life teaches us is that love is the way out. Yeah. That you can't hate your oppressors and get free. You have to be free on the inside before you're ever free.